Hello and welcome to Algebra 2 Lesson 54. In this video, we're going to learn about radical expressions. So again, we've come to a topic that we learned thoroughly in Algebra 1, and we just need to review here before we get to more challenging material in Algebra 2. So we're going to start out with the easiest scenario, which is where we deal with square roots. So I want you to recall that the square root of a number, and let's just say that number is Q, right? Just as a placeholder for now. So this is any number that when multiplied by itself gives us the number Q back. Now, by using a variable like Q, a lot of you will stop and say, well, that doesn't really make a whole lot of sense. So what you can do, you can just cross Q out and you could just pick a number that you know is a perfect square. So as an example, we know that four times four is 16. So 16 is a perfect square. So we can say 16 and 16. Now, if we reread it, we would say, recall that the square root of a number 16 is any number that when multiplied by itself gives us the number 16 back. Now, we think about 16 as what? Most of us would say it's two to the fourth power. It's two times two, which is four, four times two is eight, and eight times two is 16. We already know that 16 is four times four, but we might forget that negative four times negative four is also 16. So that's where this definition really comes in, where it says it's any number, okay? So it could be more than one. So the square root of 16 would be four, but also it would be negative four. Now, when we talk about square roots, we notate the positive square root, or what we call the principal square root, differently from the negative square root. So I would say, the square root of 16 like this to ask for four. I would say the square root of 16 like this to ask for negative four. So this one right here is the positive, or we'd say the principal square root of 16. Whereas this guy right here, because we put that negative out in front, is asking for the negative square root of 16. And the difference between the two is just very, very slight. If I look at this one, I say, okay, well, what positive number, when multiplied by itself, gives me 16? Well, we know that off the top of our head that four, or more specifically, positive four, times positive four would give me positive 16. When I look at this one, I look at this negative out in front, I say, well, what negative number, when multiplied by itself, would give me 16? Well, negative four times negative four would be 16. So those are the two different notations that you'll run across. If you see something like, what is the square root of 25? This is just asking for the principal square root, so they just want five back. If you see what is the negative square root of 25 like that, they're asking for negative five. As we learned back in algebra one, when we started looking at the quadratic formula, there's a shortcut notation for this. I don't need to separate these two like this. I can just put plus or minus like this in a compact form and then put square root of 25. This is asking for the positive or principal square root of 25. And it's also asking for the negative square root of 25. So this I can put as equal to plus or minus five. So I've accounted for both possibilities. The positive square root of 25 is five the negative square root of 25 is negative five. So this is, again, just a more compact way to write things. So let's just look at a quick example here. So we have the principal square root of four. So that's asking for what positive number, when multiplied by itself, would give me four. All of us know that would be two, right? Two times two is four. Now with this one, we have the negative square root of four. So we're saying, hey, what negative number, when multiplied by itself, would give me four? And that's negative two. Now, again, if you want to practice that more compact notation, you could say plus or minus the square root of four, and that's equal to plus or minus two. All right, so let's look at something with higher roots now. So we should know at this point that in general, when we see a square root, it's really what? If I have the square root of four like this, it's missing a number there that we normally display for higher roots because square roots are so common. Square roots are so common that we just leave that off, but that number that's missing is a two. 
that too is known as the index or the order. So in this generic example here, we have the nth root of a. So right here, this is the index, or you could say it's the order, okay? This a right here is known as the radicand. That's the value that's under the radical symbol. So we'll label this, we'll say this is the radical symbol. And the whole thing, if I looked at everything involved here, that's just known as a radical. So if I say, hey, you got this radical, I'm talking about everything. So this whole thing right here is a radical. So again, when we see square roots like the square root of four, we don't display an index or order because it's understood to be two. So if I wanted the square root of, let's say 100, I would write it like that. Now it wouldn't be incorrect if I wrote the square root of 100 like this and put a two here, it's just not common to see that. Now, as we move into higher level roots, we see something like this. I'm gonna start out with something known as a cube root. So the index is a three. This is my index and my radicand is an eight. So this is my radicand. And before we think about this, let's think about the square root for a second. If I want the square root of four, I'm thinking about what number or numbers when multiplied by itself is going to give me four. Now, the reason I'm doing that is because if I think about the square root of four, again, this is a two. So I'm saying, hey, what number multiplied by itself twice is going to give me this value here? When I look at a cube root, now I'm thinking about a number that when multiplied by itself three times, because the index is a three, is gonna give me that radicand back. So with the cube root of eight, with the cube root of eight, again, I'm looking for a number that when multiplied by itself three times would give me eight. Now, for most of you, you would know this is two, right? Two times two is four, four times two is eight, right? So that'd be your answer there. But if you didn't know something like that, you can always go back to your factoring. You can say, I know eight is what? It's four times two, and I know four is two times two, these are all prime factors, so I know it's 2 times 2 times 2 or 2 cubed. So again, the cube root of 8 is 2. Now you'll notice that I didn't give you two sets of notation for this one here. And that's not because it's a higher root, it's because this index is odd. So I want to just cover some rules that you need to know, something you want to definitely jot down. So if you see something like the nth root of a, and I know we don't like working with generic examples, but just something you can substitute in to your given example. You say that you have the nth root of a, n is even, so n is, let's say, two, or it's four, or it's six, or it's eight, or it's 10, something that's divisible by two. And then also in this scenario, a is greater than or equal to zero. So basically, a is not a negative value. If this occurs, we're gonna have two sets of notation, just like I showed you, so you're gonna have the nth root of a, like this, this is your principal root. Then you have the negative of this, so negative nth root of a, this is your negative. Right? That's the negative root. So in that scenario, like if we had, let's say the square root of four, for example. Square root of four is what? That's two. That's your principal root. Then you have the negative square root of four, which is negative two. But again, it's not just with a square root, it could be a fourth root or an eighth root. Something easy to do, let's say we had the fourth root of 16. So the fourth root of 16, many of you know that two to the fourth power is 16. Two times two is four, four times two is eight, eight times two is 16. So we know this would be two. But then you'd also have to account for the negative fourth root of 16, and this would just be negative two. Right? If I multiply negative two by itself four times, I would get positive 16 as a result. All right, the next scenario I wanna talk about, if we have the nth root of a, and n is even, and a is less than zero. So now a is a negative value. So you'll recall this from algebra one where we said we had the square root of, I don't know, let's say negative 16. What happens here? Well, it's not a real number. And we're gonna learn how to deal with this in Algebra 2. We didn't talk about it in Algebra 1, but we will have a way to evaluate this. 
using something known as imaginary numbers. But we haven't gotten to that yet. So for right now, we just say that this is not real. This is not a real number. So again, if n is even, so 2, 4, 6, 8, 10, 12, whatever it is, and a is less than 0, a is a negative value, then you're going to write that it's not a real number. So let's say you had the fourth root of, let's say, negative 625. Again, this is even, this is negative, so it's not a real number. All right, the final scenario, if you have n that's odd, okay, so your index is odd, a can be whatever. It can be positive, it can be negative, it can be zero, it can be whatever you want it to be. You're only going to have one root. And the reason for this deals with the rules for positives and negatives. If I multiply a negative by itself an odd number of times, I get a negative. So if I had something like, let's say, the cube root of negative 8. So what number, when multiplied by itself three times, gives me negative 8? Well, that's negative 2. Negative 2 times negative 2 is positive 4. Then positive 4 times negative 2 is negative 8. Just keep in mind that you are allowed to have a negative radicand if this guy is odd. Okay? It's just the case where you can't have a negative radicand when that guy is even. So a lot to kind of throw at you, especially if you didn't learn this back in Algebra 1. It's just one of those things where you just have to practice enough, and it's something you're going to have down pretty much right away. All right, so let's just take a look at some really easy examples. So we've seen this already. If I had the principal square root of 25, we know that would be what? I'm just asking for a positive number that when multiplied by itself gives me 25, we know that would be 5. Then what about the square root of negative 25? Now, again, if I have a negative radicand and I have an index that's even, in this case the index isn't shown, but it's an invisible index of a 2, what happens here? This is not a real number. This is not a real number. Now, don't get this confused with what we're going to see now. Here we have the negative square root of 25. Underneath the radical symbol, I have a positive value, so I'm okay. This is positive. It's the negative outside that's telling me, hey, I want the negative square root of 25. That's a big source of confusion, so make sure you understand the difference between the two. The negative square root of 25 is just asking for what negative number, when multiplied by itself, will give me 25, and that's negative 5. Right? Negative 5 times negative 5 is 25. All right, for the next example, we have the principal fourth root of 81. So we're asking for what positive number, when multiplied by itself four times, is going to give us 81. Well, some of you will know right away that's 3. If you didn't, again, you can use a factor tree. So take 81 and break it down. Most of you will know that 81 is what? It's 9 times 9. 9 is 3 times 3. So just a quick factor tree will show you 3 times 3 times 3 times 3, or 3 to the 4th power is 81. So that means if I'm looking for a positive value, that when multiplied by itself 4 times is going to give me 81, we know that's going to be 3. All right, what about the cube root of negative 64? Because this index is odd, I know I'm going to have one answer, and I know that the negative is allowed. This is OK, again, because this is an odd index. A negative times another negative times another negative, or three negatives, or an odd number of negatives in general, will produce a negative. So all you got to ask yourself is, take 64. Forget about the negative for a second. 64 factors into what? It's 4 times 16. 16 is 4 times 4. So without going into 4 is 2 times 2, I know I have 4 times 4 times 4, or 4 cubed, that gives me 64. All I got to do is just drag this negative over here and say this is negative 4, right? Because the negative times the negative times the negative will give me a negative back. So negative 4 times itself 3 times will give me negative 64. All right, for the next one, we have the negative fourth root of 10,000. So what are we looking for here? We're looking for a negative number that when multiplied by itself 4 times, is going to give us 10,000. Now, so I'm just going to put a negative out in front because I could just 
Forget about it now. Now I just think about 10,000. 10,000 is a power of 10, so it's really easy, right? It's a one followed by one, two, three, four zeros. So that means it's 10 to the fourth power. So the way I get that is if I'm evaluating something like this, 10 to the fourth power, you write a one and you follow it by this many zeros. So this is one, two, three, four. So kind of a cool trick if you don't know that. So I automatically know that if 10 to the fourth power is 10,000, the fourth root of 10,000, forget about the fact that it's the negative fourth root, we've already accounted for that. The fourth root of 10,000 would just be 10. So we just put negative 10 here as our answer, right? Negative 10 times negative 10 is 100. 100 times negative 10 is negative 1,000. Negative 1,000 times negative 10 is 10,000. All right, let's take a look at another one. Let's say you saw the cube root of negative 125. So again, if I'm thinking about something like this, this is negative, three negatives makes a negative. So I just start out with putting a negative there. Then you can just forget about it and you can say, okay, well, 125, 125 would factor into what? 25 times five, 25 is five times five. So five cubed would be 125. So what I'm looking for here is negative five. Negative five times negative five is 25. 25 times negative five is negative 125. All right, last one. We have the principal fourth root of negative 16. So again, I have a negative radicand and I have an even index. So when that happens, we don't have a real number. This is not a real number. And again, the reason for that is I can't take a negative and multiply it by itself four times and end up with a negative, right? It's gonna give me a positive. An even number of negatives will always give me a positive, and so that's why this value doesn't exist using real numbers. All right, let's take a look at another rule that's pretty time-saving for us. If we have the nth root of a to the nth power, so something like if you had the fourth root of, let's say, two to the fourth power, what would you guess would happen there? Well, you know from your studies of algebra one, or hopefully you remember that, this ends up canceling with this, and you're left with this, right? So if n is even, so in other words, if this is even and this is even, they're the same value, and n is greater than zero, so even and greater than zero, then what we're gonna find is we have the nth root of a to the n, we'll say this is equal to the absolute value of a. So as an example, let's just say we took something like five. So we take the sixth root of five to the sixth power. Now you don't even need to calculate what five to the sixth power is. You can just say, okay, well, if I took five and I raised it to the sixth power, whatever number that is, once I take the sixth root of it, I'm gonna be right back to five. So this will cancel with this and I'm left with this. So this would be equal to five. As another example, let's say I was working with a negative and to make it real simple, let's just make it negative two. So if I had the square root of negative two squared, what would that be equal to? Well, some of you might say, oh, that's not a real number, you have a negative down there. Well, think about squaring this first. If I did negative two squared first, that would give me four, and if I took the square root of four, I would get two. So that's where this definition comes into play. Notice how we say it's the absolute value of a. So if we're saying a here is negative two, well, the absolute value of negative two is two. And that comes from that, again, that squaring operation, or in this case, it could be anything that's even. So it raises them to the fourth power, the sixth power, the eighth power, the 10th power, whatever it is, an even number of negatives will give us a positive value. Then when we perform that root operation, we're gonna go back to the absolute value of whatever that was, right? Because we took a positive, took the root of it, and we went back to whatever the absolute value of that was. All right, the next one we wanna talk about is the other scenario where n is odd. So if n is odd and n is greater than zero, then what's gonna happen in this case? So this is odd and it's greater than zero. In this particular scenario, these two will just cancel each other out and you're just left with a. So the only difference is when you have an even involved, you gotta say, in case your A, in case this radicand was negative, you've got to account for the possibility that you do an even number of 
factors of that guy, right, because you're raising it to an even power, it's going to end up being a positive. Then you take the root and knocks it back down to the absolute value of that. So that's all we're saying here. Again, n is even and n is greater than zero. All we're saying is if this guy was negative, an even number of negatives would have made it positive. So you get back to the absolute value of that. In this scenario, because n is odd, an odd number of negative factors would give you a negative, it's okay. So as an example, let's say I had the cubed root of, I don't know, negative two cubed. Well, this is just gonna be what? This would cancel with this, and I just have negative two. All right, so let's say we saw something like the sixth root of negative seven to the sixth power. So again, without even going through and saying, okay, well, negative seven times negative seven, without giving you six factors of negative seven and then taking the sixth root of that, you automatically know that this would cancel with this, but I'm not left with negative seven. I'm left with the absolute value of negative seven, which is seven, right? So it's a little bit more complicated than just canceling things. I don't want you to make the mistake of just canceling things and saying, okay, this is negative seven, because that would be wrong. Taking negative seven to the power of six would have made it positive. And then taking the six root of that would have brought you back to positive seven. So it's important to realize that this is equal to the absolute value of negative seven, which is seven. So here's an example where we have an odd index. So we have the cube root of negative nine cubed. So in this case, you can just kind of cancel these and say I'm just left with negative nine, right? Negative nine to the third power would still give you a negative result, right? So when I take the cube root of that, it would still be a negative. So when the index is odd, I can just basically cancel these. When the index is even, I want to cancel them, and then I want to use the absolute value here. So that's the only difference you're watching out for. So now that we've kind of reviewed radicals, let's talk about fractional exponents, or otherwise called rational exponents. So I want you to recall if you have something like a raised to the power of 1 over n, this is equal to or the same as the nth root of a. So as an example, let's say I had 4 to the power of 1 half. Just kind of following this, what would this be? Well, this part right here becomes your index. So this part right here would be the index. An index of two is a square root. So we normally don't display that, but for the purposes here, I'm just gonna put a two here. And then four just comes over here. So four raised to the one half power is like taking the square root of four. And that should make sense because of the rules for exponents. If I have four to the power of one half, and I multiply it by four to the power of one half, what would that give me? Base stays the same, you add your exponents. One half plus one half is one. So this is equal to four. If I did this using this, and I said, okay, well this is the square root of four times the square root of four, we would expect that to be what? To be four, right? The square root of four is two. The square root of four again is two. Two times two is four. So it has to make mathematical sense, and it does. If I wanted something, let's say, as a cube root, a cube root. So let's say I had eight to the power of one third. Well, this would be the cube root of eight. Again, whatever's here in the denominator becomes my index or order, and then it just becomes my radicand. So the cube root of eight is the same as writing eight to the one third power. Or you take something way more advanced. Let's say we had, I don't know, 620, and let's just raise this to the power of one eighth as an example. Well, this is what? This is the eighth root of 620 because this part right here goes here and this part right here goes here. So the other thing we need to know with this, let's say we have a raised to the power of m over n. This just gets split up into the nth root of a and this is raised to the power of m. So a good example of this would be something like nine to the power of let's say three halves. So just following this, what would you see? Again, the denominator becomes the index. This becomes the radicand. And then this right here, we're gonna raise everything to that power. So if I took the square root of nine, I would get what? I would get three. And then if I cubed three, I get what? Three times three is nine, nine times three is 27. Now, there's other ways to do that. You might see your book tell you to take this guy and raise it to the third power first. So I could also say that nine to the three halves power is what? It's nine cubed, okay, so nine is raised to that power, 
and then we take the square root of that. But this produces a bigger number to take a square root of, and so it's not usually what you want to do. 9 cubed is 729, so it would be the square root of 729, which is going to give you 27. All right, so let's just look at some examples. We have 4 to the power of 1 half. We know that's just what? If you raise something to the power of 1 half, you're just asking for the square root. So it's the square root of 4. Now, again, you take this right here that's in the denominator. That's your index. So the index would be a 2. On a square root, we just don't show that. This right here, this 4, that number, that's the base when we talk about an exponent, becomes the radicand. So you basically get the square root or the principal square root of 4, which is 2. If you look at 216 to the power of 1 third, we're asking for the cube root of 216. Again, this denominator here becomes the index. 216 becomes the radicand. So what is the cube root of 216? So if you don't know that off the top of your head, just look at the last two digits. It's a 16. So you know this is divisible by 4. So this would be 54 times 4. 4 is, of course, 2 times 2. 54 is 9 times 6. 6 is 3 times 2, 9 is 3 times 3. Now, what do I have here? I have 1, 2, 3 factors of 3, and 1, 2, 3 factors of 2. So we've got 3 cubed times 2 cubed. Basically, 3 times 2 is 6, so it's 6 cubed. So this is equal to what? It's equal to 6, because 6 cubed would give me 216. So let's take a look at a harder example. So we have 81 to the power of 3 halves. 81 is going to be my radicand. My index is going to be what? It's going to be a 2. It's always the denominator. And then I'm raising this whole thing to the power of 3. So the square root of 81 is 9. 9 cubed, as we just found out, was 729. All right, let's take a look at 625 to the power of 3 fourths. So again, 625 is my radicand. And the index here is what? It's a 4. And then we want this all raised to the third power. So what is the fourth root of 625? Most of you know that is 5. 5 times 5 is 25. 25 times 5 is 125. 125 times 5 is 625. So if this becomes 5, when I cube that, I go back to what? I go back to 125. What about if we mix some things up and we ask for 16 to the power of negative 1 fourth? So what am I asking for here? Well, again, I want the fourth root. I want the fourth root of 16, and then I would raise everything here to the power of negative 1. So I can go ahead and take this first. Well, this is 2, so this would be 2 to the power of negative 1, which is what? It's just take the reciprocal of the base, so 1 over 2, raise this to a positive 1, which is basically just 1 half. Now, the other way to do this, if you wanted to, you could say, okay, I have 16 to the power of negative 1 fourth. Well, you could have started out by saying I have 16 raised to the power of negative 1, and then I'm going to take the fourth root of that. Same answer either way. This would be what? This would be the fourth root of, take the reciprocal of this, this is 1 over 16. And it's a little bit more complex here because it's a fraction, but just think about the fourth root of 1 over 16. Well, 1 half times 1 half times 1 half times 1 half is going to give you 1 16. You know 1 to the fourth power is 1, so that's easy. And then what to the fourth power is 16? Well, that's 2. So you end up with 1 half either way. All right, what about something like negative 32 to the 3 fifths power? Well, again, we're looking at, we have negative 32. And then I'm going to take the fifth root of that. And I'm going to raise the whole thing to the third power. So what's the fifth root of negative 32? That's going to give us negative 2. And we want to cube that. Negative 2 cubed is negative 8. For the next one, we're going to look at 5 raised to the power of 5 thirds over 5 raised to the power of 2 thirds. Now, just as we saw when we worked with exponents in the past, if you have the same base, which we have a base of 5, a base of 5, and you're dividing, you subtract the exponent in the numerator minus the exponent in the denominator. So 5 just stays the same. And we would do 5 thirds minus 2 thirds. Same rules apply. No matter what you're working on, no matter how complex it is, you always go back to those basic rules that you learned. So 
5 minus 2 is what? That's 3. So you would have 5 raised to the power of 3 over 3, which is 5 to the power of 1. Right? It's just 5. All right, say we take a look at m squared over m to the power of 1 third times m to the power of 2 thirds times m to the power of 1 third. So again, same rules apply. So m squared over, I'm just going to use my product rule for exponents. m would stay the same, and we would add all these exponents. So we know that 1 third plus 2 thirds is 3 thirds. 3 thirds plus 1 third is 4 thirds. So what would happen here is if I'm dividing, m stays the same, and we would do 2, which is the exponent in the numerator, minus 4 thirds, which is the exponent in the denominator. To get a common denominator, I would write 2 as what? 6 thirds. And we'd end up with m to the power of 6 minus 4 is 2, and then over 3. So you can leave it in this format, or you could write that you have the cube root of m, that's squared, or you could say you have m squared and take the cube root of that. All of these are the same. What about m cubed squared times m squared over m to the power of 1 half? Well, using my power to power rule here, I know this would be m to the sixth power and times m squared. All I would do is add exponents here. So m would say the same, 6 plus 2 is 8. So this would basically be m to the eighth power over m to the power of 1 half. So m stays the same, and I would take 8, and I would subtract away a half. So let's write this as 16 over 2 minus 1 over 2. This would equal m to the power of 15 over 2. Again, you could leave it like that, or you could write that you have the square root of m raised to the 15th power, or you could say you have m to the 15th power, and then you could take the square root of that. All, right, all of these, this one, this one, and this one, mean the exact same thing. All right, for the last one, we have x squared raised to the 2 thirds power times x to the power of 1 half over x to the power of negative 3 halves. So if I look at this, I use my power to power rule. I would multiply 2 times 2 and get 4, so this would be x to the power of 4 thirds. And then we multiply by x to the power of 1 half. And of course, this is over x to the power of negative 3 halves. So let's put this as equal to, let's deal with the numerator first. So we have what? We have x staying the same, and we're going to add the exponents. So if I add 4 thirds plus 1 half, multiply this by 3 over 3, multiply this by 2 over 2, 2 times 4 is 8, so you'd have what? You'd have 8 over 6 plus 1 times 3 is 3 over 6. 8 plus 3 is 11, so this would be x to the power of 11 sixths. Then this is over x to the power of negative 3 halves. Now, I don't need to do anything fancy here other than leave x the same, and then just subtract. So I would do 11 6 minus a negative. Notice that that's a negative, and I'm subtracting it away. So that's plus a positive 3 halves. So to get a common denominator, let's multiply this by 3 over 3, and this would be 9 6. Okay, 9 6. So this would be x to the power of 11 plus 9 is 20 over 6. Now, if you get a scenario like this, you can reduce this. We know that 20 and 6 are each divisible by 2, so we can really say this is 10 over 3. And then what we want to do is say, okay, we have the cube root of x, and this is raised to what? The 10th power, or again, you could also say you have x to the 10th power, and you're taking the cube root of that.